little bit of our study. I'm enjoying it. I think it's good. So, last week, um, we started in chapter number one, and we were looking, excuse me, I'll just get all my papers organized. We were looking at being a functioning church member, and when we started off, uh, in the beginning, we looked at what that uh, what it mean, meant to be a church member. We looked in depth at uh, you know the opening uh, of of the two men uh, as they were sharing breakfast and uh, finding out that you know I guess we're just two different church members. So I want us to once again go back to our goals, and I don't want to just reiterate and rehash because I want to have lots of time to move on with tonight. But I want us to, to understand that our goals is to critically examine what it means to be a church member from God's point of view. So we're still looking at what it means to be that church member from God's point of view to generate all ideas uh, that will help us as church members become more engaged with the life of the church in the ministry of the, in the church. Uh, as we do that, um, you know, our participation uh, brings growth to us. And so we're going to bring discussion to things that we talk about. Uh, we look at that functioning church member and what that means uh, uh, to, to, to be engaged, uh, that a membership is not as it is in the secular realm, but what does membership look like from God's realm. And I'm not talking about a piece of paper that says we're a member of a church. That's important. I do believe it's important to be a member, to be engaged in that, to have a sense of belonging, but knowing that if God calls us to a church, that this is where God has placed us, and we want to grow there. We don't want to come with the idea from a secular viewpoint of what can the church give me, but, but if God's called us there, what can I give to the church because this is the place where God has called me to be a part of and where God has called me to serve. And so looking at that service, um, let's just jump right in tonight to, I will be a unifying church member. And uh, what that looks like and, and, how, and how important uh, uh, unity is to us. Did any of you uh, look at the pledge from last week? I think that's important. Where we looked at the pledge, we were sign off, it says, I will be, uh, I, I like the metaphor of membership, it's not uh, membership as a civic organization or a country club. It's the kind of membership given to us in 1 Corinthians 12. Now ye are the body and, and individual members of it. Uh, because I'm a member of the body of Christ, I must be a functioning member. Whether I'm an eye, an ear, and hand, uh, as a functioning member, I will give, I will serve, I will minister, I will evangelize, I will study, I will seek to be a blessing to others. I will remember that if one member suffers, all members suffer with it. If one member is honored, all members rejoice with it. And then we sign off on that. So I hope that you signed off on that. It is one of six pledges that uh, this book gives us. Tonight will give us a second pledge. So let's jump in. Last week I started off reading. I prefer not to read. If you hear me talking most of the time, I prefer for you to be engaged. So someone read verse number or, 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 uh Part number uh, one of this, uh, on page 21 over to 22, I will be a unified church member. Thank you. 
All right, so it's important for us, if we're going to be a church member, to be a functioning church member, but it's also important to be a unified church member. Someone who unifies people from the pulpit all the way to the back pew, from where, wherever we are, uh, knowing that, that we are each important and we should seek to bring unity to the church. Before we go any farther, I want to ask us a question. All right, what do you think are some reasons why people in the church don't always get along? What's that? You sat in their pew. You sat in their pew. Someone took your pew. What's some other reasons why church members don't go out? You took a parking spot. I took a parking spot. All right. I always try to park away, just so you know. I feel like I'm here to serve. I have an able body, so I park away. I give give you uh, other folks opportunity to move. You can't get closer to the door. So by the way, I, I didn't take your parking spot. <laughs> What's some other things? Differences in doctrine. What's that? Differences in what we believe in, in doctrine. Or... Differences in what we believe. Uh, so that's the pastor's responsibility to lay out the word of God. It's the church responsibility to seek it, to understand it. Uh, 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 to, yeah, respect. Yeah, good. Someone else? Jealousy. jealousy. Someone's jealous of someone. They don't like them. They're envious of their gifts and, and, and not satisfied with their own. Or I'll get even with you. What's that? Or I'll get even with I'll you. I'll get even with you. Why would they say that? Maybe someone did something to them. What's that? Yeah. Absolutely. When they're under conviction, they're doing something. They're feeling guilty because of their sin. We're going to get there tonight. They're feeling guilty because of what they've done. So they're pointing the finger at everybody else. Uh, look at their sin. Look at their situation. Anything else? You think of? Mr. Rachel. Basing it on my four children. Whoa, that's good. We're going to talk about that too. Yeah, that's good. Look at the way they feel with that. Why am I better? Make them be better. Ain't as easy as it seems, is it, Brother Eli? I'm realizing that. They always are trying to find fault from our other. Sure, yeah. So, with that said, with all these things, and there can be differences, there can be all kinds of things that, that can cause disunity. So, our job as a church member is to practice and want unity. To want unity. To want unity among the body. Because that's what Christ emphatically demands of us, is unity among us. And we're going to see how that when there's not unity, what does it do to the church? Um, it's, it, it's critically important that we have unity. And we'll look at two things particularly tonight that the author talks about that really hinders the church from having unity. And really, we can take these things and we can apply them to different areas of our life and our families uh, and our workplaces. But ultimately, it's required of the church. And uh, the model of how things should be done should be the church. The church should be the model because God gave us the model. And as he gave us the model, it can be applicable for other things as well. But let's look at the model of the church. Someone read that thing called unity. It's uh, on page number 22 over to page number 24. I love King Ford's. I've seen teams with only average talent win, win championships. Don't get me wrong, talent and gifted athletes are important, but what is even more important is how those athletes work together. Unity is important. Unity is critical. Likewise, when church members don't work together, the church is weaker as a whole. My analogy would may be weak because the local church is much more important than any sports team. But I hope you get the point. Unity is vital to the health of a church, 
And that means every church member, you and I included, must contribute to the unity of the church. The Apostle Paul said a lot about unity when he wrote his letter to the Ephesians. Paul obviously liked the church at Ephesus. Look at some of his words he wrote to the church. This is why, since I have heard about your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all the saints, I never stop giving thanks for you as I remember you in my prayers. Did you pick up on why Paul was thankful for those church members? He was thankful for their faith in Jesus. And get this, for your love for all the saints. We sometimes call a real godly person a saint, but in the Bible it simply refers to Christians. So Paul was thankful because these church members were showing love for one another. Unity, unity is critically important. Paul would emphasize it again to the church members at Ephesus. He urged the members to walk worthy of the calling you have received with all humility and gentleness, with patience, accepting one another in love, diligently keeping the unity of the Spirit with the peace that binds them. You have a responsibility as a church member. You are to be a source of unity. You are never to be a divisive force. You are to love your fellow church members unconditionally. And while that doesn't mean you agree with everyone all the time, it does mean you are willing to sacrifice your own preference to keep unity in the church. But we will get to that issue of preferences later. For now, the issue is unity. For we, for when we seek unity, we de demonstrate love. Look at Paul's words one more time. This time, his letter to the church of Colossae. Above all, put on love, the perfect bond of unity. Paul said, above all. It doesn't get much more important than that. Unity is really important in your church. Are you doing your part? All right, so unity is important. The thing called unity is important. It's important for the church to be unified. Uh, when, we, when we look at unity, um, you know, I like what he said when he talked about saints. Sometimes we look at someone who's older and we refer to them as being a saint, feeling like they've lived a life or they've given a legacy. Uh, the the, the uh, portion of time of their life has made them a saint. But really that doesn't align with the Word of God. The Word of God says a saint is someone who is a Christian. So right here tonight, we're all saints. Uh, we're all saints. So sometimes, you know, you, you'll find that let me just say this, for example. You may notice that when someone comes into the church uh, and they're not saved, some, some folks may, may say, Pastor or Brother Seville, why don't you say, I'm Brother Seville? Well, first of all, I'm not their brother. Because if they're not saved, I'm not their brother. So let's put it on a common ground where I'm Pastor Seville. So I introduce myself as Pastor Seville. But to you as a saint, I can be Brother Seville because I am your brother the Lord. So as a church, if we know Jesus Christ as our Savior, He has uh, brought us into a bond of brothers and sisters, and there should be a unity that's within that, right? Amen. There should be a unified, a, a balanced family will have unity as we work together. Sister Rachel, you said it well. There are preferences that you know children have because of their personality, because of their age, because of their gender. There's there's preferences that, that they have. But there are times where we have to say it's not, not going to be about your preference right now, but it's going to be about the unity of us all and doing what we all want to do. And so, Brother Eli, you talked about raising children. I'm realizing in parenthood, it's about learning that we navigate. Yes, we have done this for you, but now it's important that mommy and daddy gets this done, and this is what I need you to do because we've worked together. And sometimes it's painful they don't understand because they're still in that age where they are very selfish because of the nature of their age. But you know what? As children get older, they don't look, look always inward. They begin to look outward and whether or not they're not as selfish anymore or they should learn not to be selfish. And so with that said, as we mature as believers in Christ, we shouldn't be selfish anymore. It should be about preferences of others, even above our own preferences, so that we can bring unity to the body. And uh, that's, that's the key that we need to have as a body of believers is that we are working to be unity, unified even if it means putting our preferences aside for the good of all. 
And so we can, we can be in a church where the word of God is being preached. We can be in a church where, where, where uh, 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 you know, uh, uh, the word of God is honored. But if, 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 uh, if we are treating people well, if we are, are, are doing our part in the love of Jesus Christ and unifying the body, it, 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 it hinders and will stop the spirit of God from moving. So we can preach and teach all we want, and it can be right on the mark, but if we are bickering among ourselves, or we're harboring hard feelings, or we're working against one another, as much good as we may be doing from a biblical point of view and teaching the Word of God, it still breaches the Spirit of God from being able to move because we have to have unity. Just the way it is. And so, uh, we, based on John 13, 35, the, the strength of the church isn't in the budget or isn't even in the, the number of uh, members that are on the roll. The strength of the church, amen, is, is based on the love of one another. And I, can, I have to say it this way, the strength or the weakness of the church is based upon the love that is for one another. So if we want to be a strong church, and we should all want to be, I want to be part of something that's strong. I do. You know, and that's, that's anything in life that I'm engaged in. I want to be on something that's successful. I don't want to be investing my time in something that's losing. You folks go to your jobs, and, and you know, you want to be successful there. None of you want to go to your job and see it close. Or see it have bankruptcy or see, see it come to an end. You're investing in that. You want it to do well. And if you don't, you're really, you're really not invested in it. God wants us to be invested in the church. That it is strong. And the strength of it comes from the unity of the members that are there. And so we need to treat each other well in spite of our, different, uh, our disagreements and our differences. We need to get along. The church shouldn't be a place where there's, there's subgroups or there's cliques or, or, or there's individuals that, uh, that, 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 that kind of are inclusive and, and not uh, including others. Regardless, if you've been there 50 years or you've been there one day, you should feel included. Or whether if you're 90 or whether if you're 9, you should be treated with love and respect and appreciation. You know, I, I think one thing that is challenging for me is I, I try to even engage in our children. They need to know that we're in, they're important to us and that we need them. Their role is important now because someday their role may be in leadership. Uh, but if they're not in, uh, in, in the right role right now, what will ever give them the desire or the relationship with God to get to that position they should be someday? So it's treating everybody with respect. Once again, not just the wealthy or not just feeling like a week we can only evangelize the unwealthy. They're the only one. We should be able to, to, to reach out to everybody. Regardless of education, regardless of social or economic status, we should be reaching out to them. Amen. And so we should be looking at what is best for the church, uh, and not, not what's best for ourselves or just for our family personally. And so we probably all been in places, uh, meetings, and, and where there's disagreements and, 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 and people are for themselves uh, and not for God. But God wants us to come together as a body of believers and make decisions on what is best for everybody. What's the best thing for everybody? So there's a real call to unity. We'll talk more about uh, Colossians 3.14 in our questions. But someone read about gossip. Someone read gossip. 24 uh, to 26. Romans 1, 29 to 31 is pretty depressing. It's a listing of many unrighteous acts. They are filled with all unrighteousness, evil, greed, and wickedness. They are full of envy, murder, quarrels, deceit, and malice. They are gossips, slanders, God-haters, arrogant, proud, boastful, inventors of evil, disobedient parents, undiscerning, untrustworthy, unloving, and unmerciful. Woo, that list will wear you out. Mm -hmm. Right in the middle of it is the evil deed of gossip. The simple dictionary meaning of gossip speaks volumes. Some dictionaries call it idle talk. 
some connect it to rumors, others say it's unproven personal or private information about others. Gossip is bad, and gossip is destructive in your church. This chapter is about unity, and few things can destroy the unity of a church like gossip. A unified church is powerful. Gossip tears that unity and renders a uh, church powerless. One of my friends who leads a well-known Christian organization told me that prohibition of gossip is actually spelled out in the employee policy manual. If an employee is concerned about another employee, he or she is supposed to take that concern directly to the employee. If for any reason the concern can't be presented directly, the employee must go to his or her supervisor. Gossip is not tolerated. An employee can even lose his job over it. Why? Because it tears down the unity and the organization. James meant snow birds when he wrote about the negative power of the tongue. And the tongue is a fire. The tongue, a world of unrighteousness, is placed among the parts of our bodies. It pollutes the whole body, sets the course of life on fire, and is set on fire by hell. James 3 6. So, how should we respond to this issue of gossip in our church? First, don't be a source of gossip. If you have any doubt whether something is gossip or not, don't mention it. Keep your tongue under control. Second, if someone in the church begins to share gossip with you, gently rebuke him or her. You don't have to be harsh in your response to them. Kindly say that you would rather not hear any gossip, and you would hope it wouldn't continue to spread. You can be a unifier in your church with those simple words. And if there are just a few more mem members like you, word will begin to travel. Other church members will know that gossip is not tolerated in your church, and the congregation will be a place of joy and unity. For the one who wants to love life and see good days must keep his tongue from evil and his lips from speaking deceit. 1 Peter 3.10 Love life, see good days, control your tongue, stop the gossip, be a unifier. Alright, so one of the two things that he's going to talk about that is a killer of unity, the first is gossip. And so Proverbs 18.21 says that the power of life and death are in the tongue. And, and so, uh, the, uh, really, the church, uh, gossip can make the church powerless. Uh, 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 it, 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 it makes it a negative place. Uh, if, if the church becomes powerless, there's not people getting saved. There's not, not people getting delivered. There's not family finding healing and unity. There's not folks getting healed from diseases. There's not folks getting delivered from things that are, are burdensome and bondages to them. Uh, we become a powerless church. I want this to be a church, amen, that sees the power of God. Maybe you've seen in the news recently, but there is a, 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 an African evangelist or pastor that is having a lawsuit because he staged a funeral and uh, 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 prayed and brought the man back from the dead. And so he is now under a huge lawsuit. Do you know what? I believe this, that the church could pray and see people raised from the dead, and it doesn't have to be staged. Amen. I believe that there is power for lives of people. People are lost. People need Jesus. People are hurting. People are broken. People carry things for years that are not meant for them to physically and emotionally and spiritually carry. And they can find deliverance at the church. But if there's gossip happening, then it, it, it hinders the power of God from moving. And so, uh, I said already, you know, spiritually uh, immature people are the people who are going to gossip. But spiritually mature people are not going to be engaged in that nonsense. Uh, they're, the spiritually mature people are going to be on a level where they love to find joy and satisfaction in others. And uh, they don't like uh, uh, talking about other people who are struggling or other people who are in wrong. But they realize that I myself have been a sinner. Everyone in here, we strive for a sanctified life. Amen. But everybody in here struggles with sin. You do. You ever get mad? You ever get angry? 
You have things in your flesh that you want that aren't pure and holy. We all struggle. So why would we want to put a magnifying glass to someone else and not allow them? Now, I'm not talking about living in sin and wanting approval of sin. I'm talking about folks that are striving to please God. Amen. So we don't want to magnify someone's struggle. We don't want to find pleasure in talking about it. But we want to see people find Jesus, find healing, find deliverance. And, uh, 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 you know, there are some other reasons why. I have to tell you, my life is super busy. It is really busy. I just said to my wife, uh, you know, when we hit Sunday morning, Sundays are a super duper busy day for us. And it doesn't stop. We have something going on every day and every night till we get to Friday night. So our life is just super busy. And, but there are some people that, that aren't very busy. Now they can't find things to do, but some people, even if they are busy, like to be busy bodies. The Word of God talks about that. Now maybe we just need to find ourselves engaged in spiritual things so that we're not busy bodies. And we don't want the church to be that way. They don't feel like we really have that problem here, to be honest. But let's maintain that problem, that, that, that thing where we keep ourselves busy about the things of God. There's some things about gospel, and I want to hurry because we have other things to read. If someone comes to you about someone else's business, you know what? They'll probably go to someone else about your business. So be careful. And if someone um, who gossips, uh, you know, they like to tell everybody else's stuff, but they never like to tell their own. That's usually the problem. It's that beam out of their own eye when they're trying to get the little speck out of someone else's eye. That's usually the folks in the gospel. And this is an interesting thing someone said to me one time, and I really, really appreciate this. How does someone who gossips view you? Basically this. Basically, if someone gossips, they're just spreading a bunch of trash. And if they feel like they can come to you and give you trash, they take your trash can. I don't view myself that way, and I don't tell other people view myself that way. So, as, as the writer says, the thing that we need to do is that if, if, if uh, someone comes to you with a source of gossip, just give it to yourself. The buck stops here. The second thing is, that they begin to do something. No, I really value our church. I know the season of time that I've been here, we are in a really good season, I feel. And I'm appreciative for that. I want to protect that, honor that. So I'm being the best church member. I want to promote unity. And so, just say, you know, I don't want that kind of talk. Or better yet, just say, you know what? just best that we pray about that. So the buck kind of stops there. It's interesting what the power of prayer will do. The power of prayer will do. Oh, let's see. I don't want to get ahead of myself. Let's go on. Let's, let's read about forgiveness and unity. Someone read there, bottom of 26, over to 29 top. Every time I tried to pray, my mind went back to my 
in secret and told no one. I was ashamed, angry, and unforgiving. I realized what God was doing. That God was to use me as a minister in the church. I had to be able to teach it. I told the fellow prayer warriors and asked God to forgive me for the sin of not forgiving. And I forgave the man who had hurt me many years earlier. The moment was liberating. A prayer life opened again. And God began to use me in unexpected ways. I would soon leave the church in my business now. God called me to a vocational ministry, and it began with forgiveness. Jesus said it clearly. For if you forgive people their wrongdoings, your Heavenly Father will forgive you as well. But if you don't forgive people, your Father will not forgive your wrongdoing. Matthew 6, 14 and 15. Unity and church will not happen if members have unforgiving hearts. You may come to members have anger and hurt because of something another member has said or done. These members are angry <coughs> at the past time sad because of something they said or did or failed to do. I love the way Paul put it in Colossians 3, 12, and 13. As he spoke directly to the members of the church, therefore God's chosen one is holy and love, put on help, heartfelt compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience, accepting one another, forgiving one another, if anyone has a complaint against them. Just as the Lord has forgiven you, so you must also forgive. Each local church is made up of imperfect members and imperfect pastors. We will make mistakes. We will all sin. Yes, we are all friends. Church unity is torn apart when members who refuse to forgive when any member is too practical to grant forgiveness. Remember, Christ loved us so much that he not only forgave us, and now he has forgiven us, so we must forgive others. It is essential to the unity of your church. Wow. That's really, that's really powerful to me. To think about forgiveness. And, uh, you know, it's, it's hard, even as we read this, it's hard when we read that, um, that, that uh, little paragraph in the Bible 28 says, each local church is made up of imperfect members and imperfect pastors. We all make mistakes. We all, we will all sin. Yes, we are all hypocrites. Wow. We are all hypocrites. We all fail. We all fail. It doesn't mean we're not striving for sanctification. It doesn't mean that we're not striving to be holy. But sometimes we fail. And I think that it's important for us to realize that we have probably hurt other people, whether intentionally or unintentionally. And likewise, people have probably hurt us, whether intentionally or whether unintentionally. You know, if if we could all hide, you know that old saying, hindsight is 2020. It's really true. You know, you look back and you see. But the power of forgiveness and that God requires us to forgive others because it is based upon our forgiveness of others if he forgives us. If we want God's forgiveness in our life for the things that we've done, and I need God's grace, I need his forgiveness, I need his help uh, uh, daily. You know, whether it's something that someone may think is just in insignificant, but sometimes the ad attitudes or my approach to things, it is incorrect. It's not godly. It's sin. It's sin. And I need to ask God to forgive me. But if I'm not willing to do that for someone else, can I expect God to do that for me? And so unity is about forgiveness. The Bible says if someone's offended us, we're to go to them. That's what the model is in, in Matthew 18, verse number 15 through verse number 20. Then if it doesn't work out, then, then, then it says that we are to go with another person. We're supposed to go with someone and approach, get this thing worked out. Get it, because you know what? It hinders unity. And if it doesn't work out, it says to bring it to the church. Now, I want to give you a different viewpoint than probably what most of you have ever heard in your life. But I want you at least to think about this. We think that this is bringing it before the whole church and making a big to-do. And, and what, what, what about if we take the context of everything that is being said there? 
about prayer and how the word two or three are gathered together, that God is in the midst of them. And if we will agree on this as a body in prayer, that the presence of God can come down and move and work in that situation. We need to pray about things. We talk about prayer. Uh, we, we hear songs about prayer. Uh, we read about it from God's word. But sometimes it's the last thing that we do. It doesn't work unless you put the tool to action. So the tool is only as good as what it is when we use it. So it's so important in our lives to forgive. There are some folks that hold on to things. I've met with people who hold on to things from their childhood. I'm sorry. There needs to be some things where you work through and you forgive and you let go. I've dealt with folks that are in their 70s and 80s that hold on to things of unforgiveness, even the people that's already died. How productive is that for your life? No, I'm not saying that maybe they were completely wrong. They did things that were wrong and wrong according to the Word of God. It's our responsibility to forgive. And then, even in the church, there can be things that happened many years ago. Let me just tell you, all of us change and all of us grow. Thank God for the grace of God that helps us grow. And so, giving grace to ourselves and to others in forgiveness. Not nurturing to cause division by that doesn't allow the presence of God to be. Because if we're not agreed together, then the presence of God doesn't come down among us. But when we agree together, that unity, then the presence of God comes down. That is the functionality of the church. And the world should see the presence of God in us as we model <coughs> forgiveness. I've said this before, and I've not spent a great deal of time on it. Sometimes it's forgiving. It's, it's forgiving others. We need to forgive others. Sometimes it's forgiving God because we're angry because we think it's an injustice that God didn't work or move or did not answer our prayer the way that we wanted or because of how things have transpired. And then it's just all for our self forgiveness as well. Sometimes we can be our own worst critic. That can be good, but that can be bad. Particularly when we don't offer ourselves the same grace that God offers us. So it's really in, in forgiveness because it brings unity. And I love how he talked about his teacher that he had to forgive and how it advanced him even in his whole entire life. Forgiving. Christ loved us so much that he died on the cross to forgive us. And now as he has forgiven us, so what must we forgive others? It's essential to church church unity. If we're going to move together as a body, we've got to forgive one another. We've got to forgive. Things are going to happen. Sometimes, and I, how many of it has ever done this? Sometimes I engage my mouth before I engage my brain. I do that, and unfortunately I probably hurt people because of that. I have to give other people for the same thing that I would do. And so it's the unity that comes. I've got to move on quickly. So we're going to do the pledge. I'm not going to read that text, but let's read the pledge. I will seek to be a source of unity in my church. I know there are no perfect pastors, staff, or other church members, but neither am I. I will not be a source of gossip uh, or dissension. One of the greatest contributions I can make is to do all I can in God's power to keep the church in unity for the sake of the gospel. Folks, Jesus is coming. The signs of the times are everywhere. I want the kingdom of God to grow. Now, one thing that I really, really want, forget my emotion, I feel the emotion of this. But I realize now more than ever, you know, I want my actions and I want your actions to always be behooving for the kingdom of God. I've seen people wounded that have left the church. And all oh, it grieves my heart. There may come times when people will leave the church. But then 
I don't ever want them to leave the church because they feel like the pastor doesn't care or the church people don't care. I want us to be a loving and caring church. If they choose to leave, that's their choice. We can't, we can't create a making someone want to be where their heart isn't or what whatever. But I never want them to be with point finger. We're going to be that kind of church. Amen. God's going to help us. You know what? I never want to be a church. I want my girls to grow up and see God in my church. I want every young person in this church to know that from the pulpit to every pew of the church that God loves them and so does the people of this church. And this is a safe place where the presence of God can minister in your life. Amen. Because we're unified in the church. Let me go quick. Say your answers quick. Don't be lengthy in your answers. I'm not saying that mean, but get very direct. Just be concise. Be concentrated. And what did Paul mean when he said in Colossians 3.14, that love is the perfect bond of unity. What does it? What does that mean for the local church? Let me turn to Colossians here and read that, or if someone already has it, Colossians three fourteen. And above all things, put on on charity or love in the bond of perfectness. Amen. Uh, complete growth. What does that mean? What does Paul mean? Let me go back a verse and read. Forbearing one another and forgiving one another, if any man have a quarrel against uh, any, even as Christ forgave you, so do ye also. And then he goes down below the next verse and he says, let the, let the peace of God rule in your hearts to the which you are called into one body or the church and be thankful. Amen. And let the peace of God rule. That is sanctification. That is sanctifying peace. So as we love, as we forgive, as we are one body, we grow in a way that is sanctified before God. It honors God. It brings unity to the body. Any other thoughts? Maturity. Maturity. Yes. We gotta grow up, right? We gotta grow up as Christians. Someone else? Mr. Richard. So when I see the word bond, I think of it as easy that we use in the shop. It, it's very strong bullying that I've got headliners in the top of the car where the whole phone together so you have to cut it together apart. And God's love is the glue that holds us together in the church. Wow, that's good, yeah. That's good. Awesome. What is the best path to take if someone brings gossip to you in your church? And what does the Bible say about it? What's the best path? I'm going to go into the joy-filled, drama-free bubble. Amen. Joy-filled, drama-free. Yeah. Amen. Bubble. Amen. That's good. Someone else? Like you said, pray about it instead of just talking about it. Pray about the situation. All right. Pray for the individual. All right. I'd also throw this one out there. The Bible says about marking those that cause division. Um, division. I'd also say mark those that gossip because the thing to remember is a listening ear isn't always just there. Sometimes a listening ear is a running mouth too. Sure. Yeah, I mean, and, and it does cause division. It does cause division. And, and, and the Bible says that there is death and life in the power of the tongue. We want it to be a life-filled church. We want this to be a dead church. Someone knows that we're just nothing but a bunch of fight, fighting, bickering, fight. Who wants to be a part of that? I don't. We want this to be a place where the presence of God is because we're unified. And folks know that God's presence is here. And they come because they want God to work and move in their life. I will say that we shouldn't be around the people. That's all. We can talk to Amen. How is forgiveness related to unity in the local church? What does the Bible say about forgiving one another? We have to forgive one another if we want to be forgiven by the Lord. Amen. That's what the Bible says. How's it related to unity in the church?
It's very important to the local church. Encourage you to. You, you do say that. I'm going to skip over the next one, uh, and actually the next two, uh, because of the time. Read those verses, look at it, think about it, sign off on your pledge, amen, as you think about it, pray about it. What did you think about tonight? <laughs>